44 today. It's a fairly large chapter broken into, uh, what do we have? One, uh, four parts. We have four parts of this. Uh, the first part is going to be the faithfulness of God. God's faithful. He will restore Israel. He remains faithful. The second part starts uh, uh, down in uh, verse number 6 where God's going to show His supremacy. He's going to show His supremacy in verse number 6. Then in verse, uh, uh, number, verse number 9, uh, uh, God's going to make... God makes right decisions. God makes the right decision. Why don't we make right decisions? Making the right decision. What's that? Because God's talking about idolatry here. Yeah, amen. We need to make the right decision. And then, of course, the, the historical and prophetic restoration of Israel at the end. And I love the last verse because he's going to bring a man into it who is uh, by the name of Cyrus, who comes along uh, at that time about 185 years after his name is actually said here. God rarely does that, uh, that you'll know, but he does do it. You know, he did do it one more time. He brought a, name's man in, a, a man's name into something, uh, and that was in uh, 1 Kings chapter 13 when the uh, young prophet uh, sees one of those uh, idols that Israel had put up in the north that Jeroboam had put up, and, and the Lord says, a man by the name of Josiah, by name Josiah, he's going to come, he's going to knock that, he's going to knock that idol down. Amen. And uh, years and years later, here comes Josiah in and just knocks it down. The best thing about the Lord is he's always right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I was reading one day about uh, archaeologists, you know, a study of rocks and everything else. And going through Jerusalem, uh, the digging and excavations, and the archaeologist had said he had gone by the King James Bible, and know what he said? He found it to be 100% accurate. <laughs> to where, what they were, what we don't realize is uh, when an area is conquered, God says something to you. He says gravity. Basically, he says the kingdom went down. That's why they dig, because it, gravity takes over and it goes down. No different than us when we die. What happens? We go to gravity. Yeah. Our body goes down, and sooner or later it goes back to whatever uh, it came from, which is basically the carbon element of the earth. Amen? Yeah. So uh, let's look at Isaiah chapter uh, 44, and uh, the first part of God remains uh, faithful. And the Bible says... In 44, uh, yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord that made me and, and formed me from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. And floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed. And my blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up. As among the grass. And grass as willows. Uh, by the water courses. And let's pray. Father thank you. We ask you to bless this time. Bless uh, thy word this morning Lord. Get it to our hearts. We love you. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. And uh, he <laughs> says yet. Yet now, yet now, even now, uh, yet now, oh Jacob, the physical part, uh, my servant. You know what God wants out of his people? He wants you to serve. Amen. you, you got to understand something. You don't have to. Nobody says you have to. God ain't going to twist your arm. Okay? I've heard it a thousand times. Uh, I don't train men in the, in the ministry. I've trained, uh, I've trained a few men. And I will say this. One thing I will never say to them is, stay put until God moves you. Yeah, no. Has God, what, what is this, Calvinism? <laughs> I mean, you have to understand something. If God, if you say to somebody, don't do anything, make God move you, you're going to be in that same place until you die. Yep. Why? God don't need you. Yep. That's what you have to understand. 
The difference is God wants you to, but he doesn't need you to. Okay? What you need, what you will find is that when you say, well, I want to serve God, that will become a desire for you. And, as, and the more heated that desire comes, the more you will move. Amen. How many of you have been out somewhere and you're just looking over at somebody and something inside you say, why don't you go talk to that person? Yeah, amen. Why don't you go talk to that person? What's that? That's, you know, it's a conviction for you. I'm not saying it's from the Lord. It could be just yourself. You're inside. Your soul saying what? You need to do something. You need to do something. And we have that inside. I know I, uh, once in a while I've been, I, I, I was out with Larry. We were talking to somebody. We, we walked away and, and we had said something to him uh, about, you know, salvation. We got past and, and Larry said to me in the vehicle, he said, all I could think inside is when are we going to change this over to the gospel? Amen. That's himself. He says that. Now, I don't know about you, but that happens to me. Yeah. Yeah, when, when am I going to get the? When am I going to say something about the gospel? And it keeps coming, it keeps coming, it keeps coming, and you think that, and then you know that's why because you know the priorities in life for you, Amen. Amen. So he says, "Yet here, O Jacob, what my servant." You know why it's good to serve the Lord because when you serve the Lord, you know. You say, "What do you mean?" Remember when they were pouring the wine water into wine? Well, the water was coming out. They saw the water coming out. It's when it goes into the cup that it went to wine. Yeah. It appears wine there, not in the pitcher. After they pour it out, that's where it came in. And it says in there, in print, the servants knew. What's that? We're out there working, and uh, we'll we'll try and lead somebody to Christ, you know. And uh, and and maybe they there's somebody else out. They don't understand. They're not saved. They don't understand. But we know. We know what's going on. Amen. Amen? Amen. We know when they got saved. We know what's going on. Amen. We know when it starts and somebody turns around and says, hey, and we start to witness to somebody, we go, okay, it's time to be quiet. Let the man witness. Why? Right. We know. Yeah. Amen. Yep. We know. Do you ever see when somebody even is saved and they don't know? What are they usually doing? Interrupting. Yeah. Why? Because they're not servants, people. Yeah. They can be servants, and when they're servants, they will know. I want you to understand another thing with it. God doesn't, God, God's not picky about who he'll save, but he sure is a little picky about who he'll use. Yeah, amen. You have to understand, that's where it becomes the heart, the heart issue. I know guys that say, God doesn't, God's not picky about who he'll use. Um, I think you're a little far-fetched because uh, he was a little picky in Leviticus. It yep. sure is a little picky in, at times that you start to see it. Look, God, will, God, will, you can be used, but I, I, let's face it, guys. Uh, God ain't going to use a street preacher in a bikini. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay? You get what I'm saying? It's just not going to happen. And that's where you get the common sense of, you're right. You're right. Amen. All right, so he says, my servant and Israel whom I have chosen. Look, it, Chosen, what's that? Israel is a prince with God already. Israel, whom I've chosen. What's that tell you? Jacob wrestled with God. It's when he got done wrestling, God says, now you're Israel. Why? You've got the right heart right there. It's the same thing with you. Look, God looks at you and he says, okay, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. And then all of a sudden, you go low, humble. God says, that's the right heart. That's the heart I need. Then what? That's how God chooses you. Right there. And he chooses you at that point. Hey, look, by John Calvin, we don't need that type anymore where uh, you just walk around like robots and God chooses everything. That isn't the way it does it. Uh, God doesn't predetermine this over 5,000 years and figure it out already. Uh, he may know and he understands, but the offers are always good. It always comes down to whosoever will. Amen? Amen. 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 So, uh, verse number two, thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. This is God speaking. God has been speaking since uh, chapter 40, and he's going to go on until 48. Isn't it great when God preaches?
to you? Guess what? You realize this? That when God speaks in here or Jesus speaks in here, you've got no way to say, well, I was just thinking and I thought it was good. you got no you got no argument. Why? Because God's the preacher. Amen. You want to take it up? Get into a prayer mode and talk it out with the Lord. Why? Yeah. You have no other choice. Right. Amen. And he says, Oh, Jacob, fear not, fear not. Look what he opens up with, fear not. What was Jacob probably doing? He was fearing. Yeah. And he says, fear not, O Jacob, my servant. And thou, Jeshurun, who I have chosen. You notice he put Jeshurun in place of Israel. Why? Jeshurun, he's going to use that. Now, we have been in Deuteronomy. What name have we been dealing with? Jeshurun. Uh, Moses was king in Jeshurun. Jeshurun. That's the same thing. He was, he was, when's that? When Israel is upright. Jeshurun means he's upright. Okay? Uh, Job was a, uh, was a perfect and upright man. What's that? He feared God and skewed evil. He's upright. He skewed evil. <clears throat> Amen? And now he turns around and he says, Jeshurun, what's that? Well, as Jacob, he's, he's, a, he's a person. As Jeshurun, he's actually walking upright. You see, he's actually doing something, walking with the Lord. That's Jeshurun. That's the Jeshurun God talks about, the upright one. That's Israel. And that's the one he chose. He says, for I will pour a water upon him that is uh, thirsty. Okay, that's that spirit. Look, look what he puts in place. He puts the spirit as almost as water here. Watch. I will pour water upon uh, him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed. You see how the spirit now looks? It's a look at water right now. Right there. He says, I'll pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon uh, thine offspring. Okay? Uh, do you remember back in the uh, Bible uh, that God said there was a, there was a, a spring there? Uh, in Jerusalem. You know, remember the name of that spring they used to use? The Gihon. spring Gihon. The spring of Gihon, right? And that spring came forward, okay? And they used that spring. And then he says, uh, he's looking and he says, follow and, and follow and serve for God. And uh, guess what? The Lord will give you two things. He'll give you water and he'll give you blessing. That's what he's looking at. I'll give you water and I'll give you a blessing. Hey, look, you serve the Lord. Did you ever notice that when you're serving the Lord, uh, I'm, look, I, I've been doing it. I've been doing it for a little while. Uh, when I serve the Lord, for some reason, it seems like the Bible opens up a little more. Yep. It just opens up a little more. Mm -hmm. Okay, it, it's how you serve. Uh, it's that heart of yours. The, I think the biggest problem we have is people think serve means I got to do something like a job and. Don't you realize that there's a sacrifice for things like prayer? Yeah, amen. Do you realize that prayer is an actual spiritual work? Why? Did you ever pray long enough? Hey, how many here about actually sat there and spoke and prayed for a solid hour? Yeah. That's tough. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus would do it for an hour. Jesus would do it all night, it said. Well, I guarantee you three quarters of the night, you know what he was saying? Psalms. Oh, amen. Why? Because a lot of them are prayers. Yeah. And God wants to hear, sometimes he likes to hear his own words. Why? He's the author. <laughs> He's the author. He says if he wants you to love thy word, what do you think he does? He loves thy word. Sometimes better speak his word than his, your words. Why? His words are better. Amen? Yeah. Amen. And uh, he says, he says here, he says, Verse number four, verse number four, uh, and they shall spring up as among the grass. Now, as willows uh, by the water course. Anybody here ever use a, a ever have wood and they cut a cut a tree called a willow, and you throw it on your uh, you throw it on your fire in your wood stove, and what happens? Well, Absolutely nothing, and it's the worst. Yeah, Why? <laughs> yes, because. Paper. Using using uh, a willow is kind of like grabbing snow and throwing it into your furnace. Why? That things are full of water. Yeah. I, the, I thought a willow tree a willow tree is real good if you take the little thongs off those little branches and use them as a switch. They're awesome. 
You want to use one of them? They're awesome. I've had one of them uh, on, my, on my legs and my back when my parents got upset when I was young. And I will tell you, they sure do their work. I sure didn't do what I did before. Yeah. I learned my lesson. Why? It was a nice willow tree that they used. But why I'm using that is he says here, he says, as willows by the water course. What's that? They suck up all the water, those willow trees. They suck it all up because they need a lot of water. Uh, go to uh, John chapter 7. Near the end of the chapter, John chapter 7. The reason, this is the reason I brought up the, the Gihon Spring is because of this, right here. Amen. Okay, in John chapter 7, looking down at verse number 37. Okay, now look, it says, this is the Feast of the Tabernacles right here. He's going to be talking about the Feast of the Tabernacles. That's where they're at. And look what he says, in the last day, in the last day, that great day of the Feast. That's the last day of the Feast, the great day. What happens there? He says, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. They're going to be flowing out of you. The reason why Christ is saying that right there is because that spring he talks about, the, the Gihon spring, on that last day of that year, it comes up and the whole tabernacle, the whole temple becomes water on the floor, and it's all that last day, that great day, and all the water comes out, and he goes, that's the flowing of the, that's a picture of the living water, amen, that's where he's talking about that, at the feast of the tabernacles, uh, you want to have living water flowing out of you, today you got a whole lot of living water that came out, we preached this morning, it's the word of God, and tonight, here comes the more living water, now he says, out of you's gonna come that thing. So what does that mean? You got saved, stay in the word, it'll come out. Amen. 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 Isaiah, back to Isaiah 44, looking at verse number uh, five. He says, One shall say, I am the Lord's. I'm the Lord's. That's a pretty good testimony. One should say, I am the Lord's. Hey, how many people uh, actually bring that up? Do you realize that your spiritual life is more important to God than your physical life, right? Amen. Okay, now the Lord turns around and he says, he says he wants to talk to you. You say, you, you say well, I belong to this and I belong to this. When was the last time you turned around and you said, I, I'm, I belong to the Lord? You notice that, I, I noticed one thing about that. Did you notice it said, one shall say? Now, I don't think God makes mistakes. I think he is bringing it down to that point of one going to say it. It's not many. It's not a crowd that says it. It's one at a time that says that. One shall say. Amen. One shall say, I am the Lord's. What a testimony. And another shall call himself by the name of Jacob. Now, that's kind of like they had a problem with in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. See, we have a problem with that. What's that? What, well, look at what we have today. I mean, how many denominations are you going to have? Uh, what is denomination? You're of a name. Now, what he's trying to say there, that's the good name. Okay, it's just like this. You want a good name? I'll give you a good name. You're a Christian. We never had to go any further. The problem isn't that. The problem is everybody else wanted to identify with it. So now, all of a sudden, let's split this, let's split this. And then it became a habit. Next thing you know, you got one that says, I'm a Paul, and I'm of a, I'm a, I'm a this guy. I'm of John Wesley. I'm a Wesley. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a this guy. I'm a Luther. Look, if you keep claiming that, you'll never go further than the man who you labeled yourself as a name. Amen? Amen. Look, think about it, people. If you admire, just say I admired Larry. 
And I did, I was trying to do everything the way Larry does. I'll never go further than Larry. Why? He's the example. I'm the underling. You understand? That's why it's not a good thing to be in camps today. You get into camps and, oh, well, Jack Kyle's, oh, yeah, and this guy, and this guy. You'll be no different than the rabbis were doing in Jesus' time. They thought Jesus spoke with authority because he said, thus saith the Lord, where all the rabbis, well, the rabbi this says that, and rabbi this says that. I hear it in preaching today. I never used to hear it, but now today you hear it all the time. Well, you know, Jack Hiles used to say this. Oh, you know, this guy used to say that. Who cares about what they said? Let's hear about what the Lord says. Amen. You know? Thus saith the Lord. <laughs> like, look, it's not, about, it's not about what an angel said. It's not about what a prophet says. It's what about Jesus said. What did, what did God say? What did the Lord say? I want to hear what that's, what you come here to hear? Did you come here to hear from me, or did you come here to hear from the Lord? Amen. So thus saith the Lord, people. Amen? Yeah. He says, I am the Lord, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, and another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord, and watch, and surname himself uh, by the name of, what, Israel. Okay? Now, a surname. Uh, a surname is... Uh, my first name is Kirk. My surname is Delaney. That's my surname, Delaney, okay? And that's what he's looking at. What's your surname? Well, I'll tell you what our surname should be. Our surname should be of Christ. Amen. That's where it should be today. It's of Christ. That's a great surname. Uh, you know, we need to unite. You know what name we need to unite under? The Lord's. That's the name we need to. The Lord's. That's where we need. And we need to unite under something else, and, and that is the Word of God. We need to unite under that. Looking down again, now we'll start in verse number 6. Now, verse number 6 is going to start in with God's supremacy. Thus saith who? The Lord. the Lord. This is important. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last. And beside me, there is no God. Now, who could be the only speaker there? <laughs> Jesus. Jesus. The God. All God. Jesus is speaking for God right there. You ever see when it says there's no Savior next to me and then you got a whole bunch of people? See? You know what the problem is? You never realized who God was. Why do you think God puts in there four times capital letters in the Old Testament, Jehovah, and four times capital letters, Jesus, in the New Testament? Why? He wants you to know Jehovah's Jesus. Amen. What does Jesus mean? J-E, Jehovah. What does he do? S-U-S, -S, he saves. That's the Lord's salvation, Jesus. It's very easy. Amen. Verse number 7 says, and, and who, as I, God, shall call and shall declare it, and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people, and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. You know, one of the things that makes him God is he knows what's going to happen in the future. And the best part about it is, is that God doesn't go into the future. He looks from the past. He looks from back where Adam was. And he looks, he says he knows the end from the beginning. That's harder. It would be easy. Just go to the end, see where everything is. I mean, man, wouldn't you like to do that? You could bet on all the stocks you wanted. <laughs> but let's see how hard it is. If you were to go all the way back in those days of those times and look back and say, this is what's going to happen. And that's how God does it. Why? That's the harder method. That's why he didn't move the he didn't move time ahead. He moved time what? Back. It's harder. It's harder that way. You can see into the past. You're hedged in. You realize that. That's what God's talking about when he says, I have set the bounds. What's that? Part of the bounds he set is the, of time, past, present, and future. You can see into the past. You've got memories. But you can't go into the past. You can go into the future, but you can't see into the future. That's how you're hedged in. And that's how God hedged you in. Amen. So, 
He says in uh, in that in that verse he's he's bringing up. He says these things that are coming and shall come. Let them show unto them. And he makes that comparison right there. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. You know, God's looking around. He's, uh, I looked in behind Pluto. I didn't see it. Who's this guy? Who's this guy, Allah? Who's Muhammad? I haven't put these guys. I've never ordained them guys. Hey, who's this, who's this guy, Joseph Smith? I never knew this guy. God's looked at Everywhere. He's looking around and he says, uh, where are you getting these things at? Where are you coming up with this stuff at? Where's this, what is this Buddha thing going on? Do you realize how he's looking at it? What is this, all this stuff? You can't figure it out yet. You haven't looked upstairs. You haven't looked out into the, to the sky yet. You know, you have to be rebellious and defiant not to realize who the real God is. And then the next thing you know, what they do is they, they think about it, they see that there's a God, and, and then later on they start to make another, more gods. Well, if one can do it, I get another one. You see, it started out, actually started out as monotheistic, and then it divided up. Yep. See, they tell you in history it went from paganism into, no, it went from one down to others. It was always one. How do you know? I've read Genesis. Yep. Amen. Amen. He says, uh, he says in verse number nine, we start a new section. <clears throat> that they may make a graven image. Or that that uh, they that make a graven image are all of them what? They're vanity. They're empty. And they're delectable. Things shall not profit. And they are their own witnesses. They see not nor know that they may be ashamed. Uh, this, idolatry is a waste. It's a waste of your time. And let me tell you something. You're going, to, you're going to fall into it. That's the thing you have to understand. You will fall into it. It's that, what's the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me, Right? So what do you think the most uh, the most biggest sin is? Money. I thought that, but it's not. It's idolatry. Well, yeah. Looking to other things. Yes, looking to something else. I mean, even to the point where God turned around. Now think of this. He has Abraham. Abraham's been out of the will of God for 15 years. And then all of a sudden, God shows up and he says to Abraham in Genesis 22, Abraham, take your son. Your only son, Isaac. The only one he recognizes. And he says what? Go sacrifice him. Why would he say that to him? Because Isaac has been in the way. Abraham, I don't want to talk to you. Why are you putting this kid in the way? Look, it was the son of his old age. His wife was... You've you got to think about it. His wife's like almost 100 years old and she has a baby. She's 90-something years old. She's got a baby. And it's, she's past her time. How do you think she cared for that baby? She never had one. That was everything. Abraham, you better take care of this. Get rid of that kid. Get rid of that kid. Get them all out of here. Why? Because this one. So how do you think Abraham? Because a man submits to his wife. And there it is. He's, he's, he's looking towards Isaac. And God says, hey, wait a second here. I've been trying to talk to you for a while here, Abraham. Let's, let's get the kid out of the way. And now. When Abraham was willing to do that, what God said, that's what I like. Now, Abraham, things are going to change. That's the greatest test. Hey, look, it's going to happen. It happens to you. And I know, I see it in your life. Uh, sometimes it's actually your own wife. In the ministry, it's been, for me, my biggest test was my wife. She wants to go this way. Because it says, you know, the things of the world in 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 1 Corinthians chapter 7, to please your wife. Well, then all of a sudden, you're, you're moving along, you're moving along. God says, hey, hold on, I've changed the course here. I want you to go this way. So now you start going this way, and where's the wife? Now she turns around and says, no, 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 you, you come this way. you got a choice to make, don't you? 
and you, you're looking at it, let me tell you something. It's not an easy choice. It is not an easy choice. Why? Come on, people. Why do you think God makes Proverbs and he says something about a continual dropping? Hey, look, it's the same thing for a wife on a husband, too. It's, it could be even harder for the wife, for, for a wife trying to serve God, and then, you know, you've got a bullheaded husband. I'm bullheaded. I understand it, okay? I'm tough to deal with. Everybody in here knows it. Once I get something in my mind, it's it. It could be it that moment, you know? I know. You all go home and make fun of me. That's good. <laughs> Amen. Uh, verse number 10 says, Who hath formed a God and, or a molten, or molten a graven image that is profitable uh, for nothing? Who could have? What, what, what's this? You formed a, who hath formed a God? You know, God doesn't even want you to know what he looks like. That's why when Jesus left, what does he say? You no longer know him after the flesh. Why? So he got, you don't put up your little pictures of, you know, the Jesus thing knocking on the door thing. And you got to say, why? That's Jesus. Is that what he looks like? Hey, let me ask you a question. I'll give you one. I'll give you one real fast. How many pictures have you seen of Jesus without a mustache? Not one. Now, let me ask you a question. You go into Leviticus, and you got a person with leprosy. What are you supposed to do? Unclean, unclean, unclean. You're supposed to cover your upper lip. It's a word of unclean. So the Levites obviously didn't have these. So what about Jesus? I bet you I, I, would, I would stem the look at maybe he didn't have this. Because it would be a sign of being unclean. I'm just trying to look at things. That's just one of those things you, you think about when, when you catch something like that. Amen? But now all of a sudden you get somebody upset. Why? Because that picture up there. Come on, man. That picture, the guy looks like he's Irish German. <laughs> Jesus was Jewish. We don't know him after the flesh anymore. You know about as much as everybody else does. He had black hair and bushy. Uh, he had uh, white skin and, and he had gray eyes. He had a beard because they pulled on it. But you don't know if he had a mustache. Uh, we know what he. We knew he was wearing uh, like a poncho. But other than that, you really don't know what he looks like. We don't know him after the flesh anymore. It's okay to draw a picture to show some visual aid. But when you start to put that up and say, and think, well, I'm looking at Jesus, and there he is, right? You got the wrong way. When I was a kid, I grew up in a Greek Orthodox church. They were making out with the pictures. I know. I was there. I, I did it once. I went over. I, uh, ah. They had stuff on. I got crazy after that. I was faking it. Amen. Verse number 11, he says, Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed. And the workmen... Uh, they are, are of men. Uh, let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up. Yet they shall fear and they shall be ashamed together. The smith, we know that's a blacksmith, right? The smith with the, with the tongs both worketh in the coals and, and fashioneth it with hammers and, and, worketh, uh, and worketh it with the strength of his arms. Yea, he is hungry. And his strength faileth. He he drinketh no water and is a uh, faint. You know what's happening is? Here he is. He's building an idol. Okay? And he's doing that work that's there. And it says he's getting tired. He doesn't care. He just keeps doing it. He's doing a vain project, making an idol, and he's actually going to get nothing from it. A thing can't speak, can't think, can't do anything. And here he is fashioning it and putting all this work. What does it say? Idolatry takes work. In fact, it takes a lot of work. How do you know? We've been doing it for a while. We've been doing it for a while, people. Man, have you ever walked in a Catholic church? Go over to the Vatican. I bet you that took a lot of work, didn't it? I mean, let's get let's get uh, those guys, Da Vinci and all them, to paint the ceilings and Michelangelo or whoever. Get them all out there to do all these things. And at the end, guess what they got? Absolutely nothing. It was a bunch of vanity. And after the world's gone, nobody's even going to know it. It was such a waste of time. 
You think that making that Vatican and all those great buildings, hey, look, look at some of the churches we have, people. I mean, man, oh man, they put a lot of work into that out that, oh, across the street. You know, how many people got saved last year? Most likely none. That's where it comes from. Let's make a big building. God's sitting there going, I didn't ask you for a big building. Even God turned around and go, did I ask you guys to make me a building? Right. Yep, right. Did I, did I ask you to make me it? No. I didn't want God to be... I didn't ask you to do it. If you want to do it, here's the specifications. God has always wanted to be here. Amen. That's where he wants to be. And that's where he wants to be right now. Right here with you. Not in some building. That's why he took him down to the upper room. And then look what happens at Pentecost. They hear a sound of a rushing wind. It comes down. And it says there appeared, manifested above them. What? There appeared what? Cloven tongues. What's that tell you? Isn't that the same instance that happened at the tabernacle and the temple? Now what is he saying? Each one of you is a little temple. That's what he's looking at. God never needed the buildings. He never wanted the buildings as much as he wanted you. He wanted Israel at that mount in Exodus 19 and 20. He wanted those people to listen to him. He was going to give them an ability to have conversation, hearing him preach and what the people say. You go talk to him, Moses. Why? We don't want to. So now God has planned, planned whatever, G, F, whatever. Now he's got to talk through what? An intermediate and an intercessor. Yep. And now you, that's why we have preachers today. You could have went right there if we all would have wanted it. Israel would have got done. They would have evangelized and we would have taken the same route. I don't know if I'd have been alive, but guess what? That was what God wanted. Amen. Um, verse number uh, 13. The carpenter stretcheth out his rule. He marketh it out with a line. He fitteth it with planes, and he marketh it out with a, with a compass, and maketh it after the figure of a man, and according to the beauty of a man, like, oh, excuse me, that it may remain in the house, okay? Uh, what's that? Well, he makes it like the figure of man. You know what I'm talking about. They got him on the dashboard. People put him on the dashboard, those little things. Uh, people put him all over with. He says, that's what, that's what they look at, what, so it doesn't move. Let's, let's put that thing upright. Let's uh, fasten it down. Why? So it doesn't move. You're putting so much emphasis on those idols, is what he says. There's idols you don't even realize how many you have in your life. Uh, until, guess what, they get taken away. It's like you can't do without it. I want you to understand, you can do without anything but the Word of God and the Lord. Amen. I think one of the biggest things that we have going for us that kind of is a hindrance is that God never leaves you and he sealed you to the day of redemption. Could you imagine if he would take thy Holy Spirit away from you just for a few minutes and... You would know it. Why? Because let me tell you something. I have, I, I, here's a good experiment. Here's a good experiment. Please, Nadine, I'm going to give it to you. You're going to experiment on this. Think unsaved. Think like a person that's unsaved. I mean totally. Okay, think there's no doubt. How are you doing with that? You're not going to do it. Are you? <laughs> Why? You can't think like that anymore. God changed that. You have to actually lie to yourself to do it. And it's frustrating to try. Why? Because you can't. It's like I told you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. What was, if you take away the heaven and the earth, what do you got? You got God. What was before everything? Just God. Think on that for a little while. You can't. Because there's no place to put it. There's no time to put them in. And guess what? There's no matter. It's just incredible. To think on that. Your head will explode. Amen. He says after the, after the figure of a man. He says that it may remain in the house. He heweth him down cedars. And, and he taketh the cypress and the oak. Which he strengtheneth. 
for himself among the trees of the forest. He planteth an ash, and the rain doth nourish it. He puts this a lot of work into this. Then shall it be for a, a man to burn. For he will take thereof and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth it and baketh bread. Yea, he maketh a god and worshipeth it. He maketh it a, a graven image and he and, and falleth down there too. I mean, if that didn't make you laugh, I don't know what will. Yeah. If you really read that, what he's saying is when it gets old, what do you do? You got thrown in a fire, drop out worthless, get some heat out of it. I mean, that's the thing that's been helping you is that idol, and now all of a sudden uh, it's just it's just worthless. I, I remember uh, I had a friend who had a had a, a, a thing outside of his house, and um, it was made of wood. It was a bear, and then one day he finally picked it up and realized all the termites were in it, and it was getting hollowed out. And he walked over, and it was looking nice, and then all of a sudden he went like this, bam, and the whole thing crushed, and it turned into crumbs. What was it good for then? Throw it on the fire. And that's what he said. You can warm your hands from it. That's about what it's good for. Warming your hands. Okay? Uh, verse, number, um, verse number 17, he says, And the residue thereof, of, then the residue thereof, he maketh a god, uh, even his graven image. He falleth down unto it, worshipeth, and worshipeth it. And prayeth unto it, and saith, Deliver me, for thou art my God. I mean, imagine what it felt like the day Israel split from Judah, and all of a sudden Jeroboam turns around and goes, Hey, look, Israel, I got these two cows out here. And what does he say to them? These be the gods that brought you out of Egypt. They think they're still, you got to understand something, people. Even a, a Roman Catholic up here that thinks he's worshiping the same Jesus we're worshiping. It's another Jesus. It's another spirit. Uh, I, I remember when I got saved, uh, they were talking about it. And I, I, I think it in my head, it's, they, they're worshiping the wrong God. They're sending people to hell in the name of Christ. That's what's sickening about the whole thing. And don't you think the Protestants aren't on it too, people? They now have a religion. There is no difference. Everybody's going back. You know why everybody's going back? Because, let me tell you something, when they got the new manuscripts to do all these new modern Bibles, people, you better realize those manuscripts are the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus. You know what that tells you? They are Catholic Bibles, people, because that's where they found those manuscripts, people. Like it or not, that's where they found them. They were pristine, and that's why they, well, these are older than the others. That means, hey, let me, let me give, tell you this. Uh, there's people older than you are, and they don't know a God like you do. Why? Because they didn't submit. You see, you see them Bibles you have? Some of them are worn out. You know why? Because they're red. If you don't read something, it's still pristine, sitting on, sitting on the shelf over there. When people turn around and say to, say to me, well, those other manuscripts didn't make it. Yeah, because they were read. That's why. They had to keep getting them copied because people kept picking them up and reading them. That's what's happening in China right now. They got one book for about 20 people. What do you think they're doing? They're ripping the pages out and reading them. What do you think it's like when the, when the last person gets it? <laughs> it's pieces of crumbs by that time. When they're used, they become pieces of crumbs. Amen, amen. Uh, verse number, um, verse number uh, eighteen. He says, "They, they, that they have not known nor understood. Why is that? For he hath shut their eyes. It's their own fault, people. Just like with Pharaoh, he says, Pharaoh, God hardened his heart. But what you didn't realize is that Pharaoh was moving away from God. If you draw nigh to God, He will what?" Draw nigh you. Now put it the other way. You move away from God. What does he do? He moves away from you. Hey, Rosie! Glad you made it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I thought it was for 7 o'clock. <laughs> he says, For he hath shut their eyes, watch, that they cannot see, and their hearts that they cannot understand. What's happening? Willful blindness. 
The Bible says that some people are willfully ignorant. What's that? They want to be stupid. They want to, look, look, it's as easy as this, people. It's like being an atheist and thinking there was a big bang, came from monkeys, all that stuff. That I've, I've actually debated these people that, are, that say they're scientists, and here's the th I wasn't even saying that I was doing it. But here's the thing you get. They'll say to you, well, you've got some magician that just makes boom, 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 everything's here. But look at their argument. There was nothing. It all got here by accident. Next thing you know, there was a nothing that blew up, and now there's all this something. What did they just say? Same thing you just said. You just know God. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't even make sense, people. Doesn't even make sense. It's willful ignorance. That's what it is. Verse 19, Isaiah 44. Verse 19. And none considereth in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned part of it in the fire. Yea, also, I have baked bread upon the coals thereof. I have roasted the flesh and eaten it. And shall I make the residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stock of a, of a tree? You, you see how, you, 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 maybe you should ask these questions. Should I, should I fall down on that thing I just burned? What happened to it? I mean, you throw it in the fire and it's gone. What happened? To, I mean, there's the time you say, where's your God now? Yeah. I mean, people say that to you when you go down, man. You're, you're in a bad situation. You're in a bad time. And what do people say? Where's your God now? You know, they don't care about you. Right. Where's the comfort? Yep. You know what you're, I'm telling you now, man. I know friends. You know what your friends are like? Tell me. I'll tell, I won't tell anybody. <laughs> Why would you want to tell them if they say that? I'm telling you now. They're telling, every, they're telling the next person. They're telling the next person. The next thing you know, it's in the Governor Tribune. But it's just call them up first. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> he says... Verse number uh, 20, he feedeth on ashes, and, and a deceived heart hath turned him aside, that he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, is there, is there not a lie in my right hand? Once his heart is turned, uh, it's, it's become that bad. And you've got to understand something, what God's saying, I can't even deliver him now, his heart's gotten that bad. Can't even do anything with it now that his heart is that bad. Your night, your idol. You got to understand something. You know what? Your idol is never going to say to you, "Thou shalt not," because you made it in your own image and you made what you wanted out of a god, and your god is never going to tell you no. That's what it's going to come down to. Oh, you, hey, you, you can go to heaven even if you even if you don't believe in God. Did you hear a guy say that recently, a few years ago? People are going to heaven, even if they don't believe in God. Because God's been calling them out for his name. And then he subverts, a, subverts a, a passage out of the Bible. These people are being called by my name. I'm calling them out. I'm calling them to my name. Therefore, they're all saved. I've heard this. I've heard them say this. You know what that is? That's a bad perversion. That's a bad perversion of things. I mean, imagine that guy uh, standing before God someday. When he turned around, he said, you teachers, you blind guides of the blind. He, what did he say? You will receive greater damnation. And then he said to some other, you go to the lowest hell. So what's that tell you? There's at least three different stages of that place. Their damnation is just. They will receive greater damnation, a little worse. And then they some go to the lowest hell. Like it or not, you can't get past that God said there's... there's there's different three. sections. Yep. I guess it gets hotter as you go further down to that core. What's in the core? Well, that's where paradise was. It was like a hurricane, the eye of the storm. Amen. Uh, verse number 21 said, Remember thee, these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee. Thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou shalt not be forgotten of who? Of him. This is why he's bringing. They, this is why he's bringing this thing. He says, "I know you're. I know you're going to struggle here, Israel. Why?" He says, "Look at this. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. 
return unto me. Why? For I have redeemed thee. The Lord is looking at them and he's looking at you. And you know what he's looking at you as? Like a child. That's how he's looking at them. Remember he said, you've got to come to me what? Like a child. You're young. Hey, when you got saved, were you mature? No, you're a babe in Christ. Okay, what does a babe do? He asks the questions all the time. They need something. They cry for it. Then they start to walk and they start to be a toddler. And the next question is why? I, can I have it? No. Why? And they keep asking that question, why? And Until you finally say, because I said so. <laughs> why did you just say that the first time? Why did you start to have a dialect with a three-year-old that wants to know why? And he's just thinking about putting it in his hand. You're getting a dialect going with the look. Because I said so. My dad used to always go like this. I used to say, why? And he said, he'd say, you can't have that. Why? Be because I didn't want to hurt you. <laughs> sure shut me up. Amen. Okay. <laughs> God knows his own. He's not going to forget you anyway. But he says, I blot it out. Now, you'll notice some things God talks about blotting out. He can, he'll blot out your sins. He'll blot out your transgressions. Okay? As of sins, we all know iniquity, transgression. Iniquity is where? Inside. Transgression goes to the outside. That's why he was wounded. Outside wounded. Cuts. He was wounded for our transgressions. They're on the outside. They're the things like the murders you could have committed, you commit, the people commit. And then on the inside, you're a murderer. That's the iniquity. Bruises. They're on the inside. Amen? He says, I'll blot out. You never notice he says, I'll blot your name from under heaven. There's the book of the living from under heaven. Okay? And then there's the Lamb's book. Nobody gets blotted out of that one. That's the difference. But he can blot your sins. Why? He blocks them and puts you into the Lamb's book. Amen? Amen. Amen. Verse number 23. Sing! You should if you're redeemed. Amen. Sing, he says. Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest, and every tree therein. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and glorified himself. Where? In Israel. You know what redemption brings? Song. I mean, one day I had a Jehovah Witness. Comes to our house. He's going to witness to us. We were in our house. I let them in. I want them in. Why? I get a great audience. It's my house. Okay? I don't have to work. These people that say, we can't let him in because he's preaching the wrong gospel. That's You better realize something. Maybe in the tribulation. But right now, we got a freebie. It's time. Absolutely. Plus, it's cold outside in the winter. If you're in the winter, bring them inside. You need to talk to them, too. they got to hear the gospel. You have the home field advantage. That would be like saying somebody, a Mormon's come in here. Ah, oh, shut up. Oh, they got the wrong gospel. No, sit down, you'll learn something. We used to have them in. They used to actually come in and we used to talk to them. They came for classes on Wednesday night. What happened? They got saved. Amen. A couple of them got saved from right up right around here. You know what? We didn't see them no more. Why not? They left. They left the Mormons. Went back home. Probably talked to their parents. Hey, look, whatever you're following is wrong. Amen. He says... It brings singing. Sing, O ye heavens. Why not? For the Lord hath done it. Shout. He, he wants to be glorified. Where? In Israel, amongst his people. Verse 24 brings assurance. He says, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. What? I am the Lord that maketh what all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone. That spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. That frustrateth the tokens of the liars. And maketh diviners mad. That turneth wise men backward. And maketh their knowledge. What? Foolishness. It makes it foolish. I mean, it's like the best they got. Look, the best they got. This is the best. Now, why do you think Moses left it? He had the best of Egypt. What's the best you got? It came from a monkey. 
That's the, that's, that's the best you came up with? I mean, all the things you could have come up with, and it's a monkey. All the things you could have come up with, a big bang of nothing. And then you start to sit there, and it's just all it does is bring up more questions and more questions and more questions. Why? They don't have an account where the God of the universe actually told you how it happened and then got into definition in the second chapter. What are they going with? Bang, boom, boom, nothing. And they can't explain anything else. Why? You've got, you got other planets going the other way. It goes against all science. You know what they're counting on? Your stupidity. And that's what, the, that's what everybody counts on. The government counts on your stupidity. You won't do the math. He says, he says that frustrated the tokens of the liars and maketh the miners mad and turneth wise men backward and maketh their knowledge foolish that confirmeth the word of who? His servant. We tell, we tell people, right? We tell them how to get saved, and, and guess what? They do, and you know what that does? That confirms what God actually said. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart, how that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Somebody confesses with their mouth and believes in their heart, and guess what? They're saved. Amen. Mm -hmm. And you know what? It's proof right there, and that's what God's talking about. I confirmed, what I, I confirmed it. I confirmed what you said out of your mouth. That was my word. Amen. That's what he's talking. And perform at the counsel of his messengers that saith to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be inhabited. And to the cities of Judah, ye shall be built. And I will raise up the decayed, the decayed places thereof. That saith to the deep, be dry. And I will dry up thy rivers. That saith of Cyrus, he is my servant. You know what Cyrus actually means? In a Syrian language, you know what it means in Chaldean? It means my servant. Cyrus means my it means my shepherd, actually. My shepherd. I think that's what it what it moves in. He says, He is my shepherd. Thou sayest to Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. And what God is actually saying is, I understand the problems you had. I understand even the idolatry. I know you did it. Uh, you are my people, Israel. You know what he's saying at the very end? I will not forget you. And you realize, that's what he's saying to the church right now. Because we're right now, we're in perilous times and we're worried, uh, worried and worried and worried. There's people that are so worried today of things. And you know what God's trying to tell you? I haven't forgot you. I saved you, he's saying. I haven't forgotten you. Amen. The problem isn't that. The problem is we don't really believe them all the time. That's the problem. Is we can't believe God all the time. We, we can't take him at what? At his word. We can't. Now look, you, you take me more times out of my word sometimes than God. What If you say to me, if I say to you, hey, I'll meet you here on Tuesday at 10 o'clock, and then all of a sudden it's 10, 15, you start calling me, uh, you're, you're, not, you're not here. I know. I'm here. I forgot. It's what was I? I? Larry understands. I am unreliable. But I want you to understand something. If God said he's coming back, he's coming back. Yes. I'm unreliable. He's not, and God's sitting here saying, I haven't forgot you yet. He's going to encourage his people through this. Even before they go into captivity, he's going to encourage them. And he does it left and right and left and right. He does it in other books. He does it in Jeremiah. He wants them to know, look, I know you're going down there. Build houses. Dwell there. Make kids. Why? Because I'm not going to forget you after 70 years. You're coming back. And you know how great he is? He didn't start with Zedekiah. He started with Jehoiakim. At the first siege is where he started. Of the three sieges that were taken that they took Judah, they started with Jehoiakim. And then, Je, 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 that weird name, Jehoiachin. Okay? And then the last one is Zedekiah. It would have been, should have been 70 years from Zedekiah, but not God. He has mercy. What does he do? He counts from Jehoiakim. Why? Because he's, he's marvelously good. Marvelously good. 
You better bank on the fact that God has not forgotten you. Amen. That's what you better bank on. And it's all right here to know. See that name Cyrus? He wanted them to know, man, when you hear a name by Cyrus, you're going back home. When you hear a name, the name Cyrus is going back home. You know what God said to you? He said to you, he said, when you start to see these things unfold, you better start looking up. Look up. Amen. You know what we should be doing right now? We should be looking up. Why? Well, think about it, people. God runs two dates. He runs a physical date. He runs a spiritual date. The physical date is Rosh Hashanah, the civil date. What's the spiritual date? Passover. Jesus' his birth, his first birth, uh, his birth, he wasn't born again, his birth into a man was right there at Rosh Hashanah, the new year. And then guess what? But we have to be born again is that his death. That's what it counted for us. Okay, what's that? Passover, this is the beginning. That's why you have two births. Now, if Jesus was born in two, in, at the, at, right there at the pinnacle of time, and just so you know, don't listen to scholars. God sets the times. Amen? That's what it says in the Bible. Scholars are telling you, we're off by four years. We're... Don't listen to that stuff. God knows exactly what time it is. They don't have enough power to set that. If that's the case, Jesus was how old when he died? 33 and a half, right? 33 and a half, yeah. Okay. He said he'd be 2,000 years with the church, two days. What does that make it? 2,000 what, 33? Knock, <laughs> knock off seven, people. Knock off seven. What do you got? 2,026. You better start looking up. He has not lied to you. It's coming. Just so you know, if it goes past 2068, he's not God. Rome, he's not God. Throw the book away. Why is that? 120 years for judgment. Remember Noah? It's 120 years God gives you. I'll give you another one. In 1901, we brought the first modern version into this into our country. It was called the ASD. Okay? What year is it right now? 2021? We're 22 now. Have you noticed that the judgment of God came upon us? 120 years and judgment comes. Better start waking up, people. It's here. The book of Revelation, Matthew 24, they're all opening up in front of you. And the storyline is being set. You better start looking up. He's coming back real soon. When is he coming back? Start looking at Pentecost. Why? That's when he, that's when he the Holy Spirit came. He said, if you, he's going to come back. He's coming back at Pentecost. The winter is past. The flowers, the rains are over. The flowers are bloomed. April showers bring May flowers. The, the time of the turtle, the turtles, the singing of the birds. When's that? It's June. When do, the, when do people like to get married? A June bride. You don't, you got to understand, people. They, God gets that from the book. Don't be so surprised if it ain't on a Wednesday. Why? That's a wedding day. Wednesday. I, I, I just pray, think of these things. Just so you know, in, chap, in Pentecost in uh, in Pentecost in 2024 is 612:24. Uh, just so you know, I'm not guessing a date. Just so you know, that's still the first coming of Jesus Christ. That has nothing to do with the second coming. His body is still here. That's why they have the feasts in Leviticus chapter 23. What's that? You have four feasts, and then you have three feasts. The first four feasts are the first coming of Jesus Christ. What's that? Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, or Feast of the Weeks. Did you ever notice the Feast of the Weeks is 50 days afterwards, and it's only one day? All the others are seven days, all three. All the other feasts, the, the three and the three, are all seven days. They all went down for those. You see them celebrate the Feast of the Tabernacles. You see them celebrate Passover. Okay? There's one you never see them do. What's that? Pentecost or Feast of the Weeks. The only one that shows it is Jesus Christ. Why is that? Well, the Jews missed it. They missed it. And they're going to miss the rapture. Because they rejected him. He came unto his own. His own received him not. It's a Gentile, basically a Gentile church. And we'll go up. And then... After we're out of here, 
then they're going to start the day of the Lord. Until then, that's why it's a last trump. Last trump of what? Church age. This is easy to figure out. It gets to be easy. It's still the first coming. Why is that? His body's still here. You are a parenthetical age. What's that? If they didn't reject them, you wouldn't be here. You're an additive. That's why the first mention of Paul. Have you ever notice the first mention of Paul in the Bible in Acts chapter 13? How is it placed in there? In parentheses. It's in parentheses. The first name Paul in parentheses. Why? You're a parenthetical church. This church is parenthetical in time. What's that? If, if you weren't here, it could still happen. That's why Jesus was offering it to them right then. You see? Now you catch him? Yeah. Opened your eyes a little bit. Mm -hmm. He's coming back real soon. Yes. Let's pray. Father, we thank thee, Lord Father. We thank you for talking about the scriptures tonight, Lord God. We thank you for opening our eyes, our hearts. Oh, Lord, you're really good to us. Give us all that prophecy to see things, Lord God. Uh, we are a spoiled people to get this book and and to be able to read this in our own language, Lord Father, to go through this Bible. I love you, Lord, and I thank you. I pray, Lord Father, our people would see that and they just bow their heads and worship thee. We thank you, Lord, for declaring things to us. We thank you, Lord, for our singing. Let us be joyful with it and realize let's not underestimate song of the Lord and let us not underestimate the scriptures which bring him forth. We thank you in all things, and we love you, Lord. Let us go in peace in Jesus' name. Amen.